This is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rashan Senanayak. What's up, listeners? Welcome to Inspiring Design with yours truly. This is where the best of the best brands, experts, change makers, and thought leaders come together to share their valuable insights, experience, and knowledge. Our goal here is to be the missing link between education, design, and the industry. Before we get started today, I want to give a shout out and a huge thanks to our sponsor for this episode. Help us pave the way and it's none other than Telstra. Telstra is Australia's leading telecommunications and technology company. Their purpose is to build a connected future so that everyone can thrive. Not to mention, Telstra is also the largest IoT network with over 4 million square kilometers of coverage that connects millions of millions of devices across the country. So today's episode is going to be all about IoT and education. So here with me to lead the way, I have what's called the technology evangelist straight from Telstra, Michelle Howie. Michelle is the developer advocate of Telstra Dev, Telstra's API and IoT marketplace where she leads engagement with external developer community. As a tech evangelist, she drives awareness and adaptation of emerging technologies such as 5G, IoT, VR, AR, mobile computing, as well as AI. Not to mention, Michelle is a global shaper of the World Economic Forum, similar to myself, a hackathon hustler, as well as another fellow podcast host. So I don't know about you, but I'm I'm excited to get straight into it. So without any further ado, Michelle. Welcome to Inspiring Design. Hey, Rashan, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm a big fan. My pleasure, my pleasure. So let's kick things off. Can we start off with a little bit of background on yourself? What's your story? Yeah, my story. So I'm what you would call a technical evangelist. So if you haven't heard that term before, it's pretty much about spreading the good word about technology to all kinds of audiences. That means in my work, I could be speaking to engineers and developers who are making and designing tech products. I could be talking to the consumers and the users of those products who don't really care about the technical jargon, or maybe to business leaders who want to know more about the impact and strategy of the technology. So it's pretty varied, the work uh, that a technical evangelist would do. Um, Right now, I'm a developer advocate specifically at Telstra, and I work on Telstra Dev, um, our API and IoT marketplace. Uh, Before that, um, I was on the Gold Coast uh, with the 5G Innovation Centre where we launched Australia's first 5G network, which was pretty exciting. Um, That's a photo I took in the background here of the Gold Coast. Um, But I I am an Adelaide girl myself. I'm back in Adelaide now. I I did my honours here in electronics and communications engineering, um, which is funny because I've got an engineering degree, but I'm definitely not an engineer and I never wanted to be an engineer. But... Um, we'll get into that later. But during my degree, I you know, went overseas and did some work experience in Korea and Hong Kong. Um, but yeah, it's funny to look back on my story because when I finished high school, and I'm sure some of your listeners will relate, but you know, I wanted to do graphic design. So I was you know, pretty focused on that. My favourite subjects at school were like sports and English literature and stuff like that. I even had marketing as my first preference at uni. So it's funny to think, you know, fast forward a few years that um, I was sort of swept up, swept up into that wave of trying to get more women into STEM. Um, and that sort of, I let that guide me to where I am today. And I absolutely love it. I mean, um, you've said it in your podcast a few times that creativity and design and communication, all the things that I really love, like they're essential, even in technology. So yeah. I've continued to pursue those, those passions, even in, within this space. And um, yeah, like I absolutely love technology, but none of my hobbies are a techie or, you know, I don't pull apart computers in my spare time. I, you know, edit videos and, and learn another language and stuff. So, And yeah, I think that's the beauty of it because it's, it's um, tech, you know, technology evangelist is probably not even a, a profession or, or an industry that existed five years ago, I reckon. It's, um, or even maybe 10 years ago, but 
it's that's why I think the beauty of it, all these techie things, we normally have that mental image of, you know, you need to be able to pull apart a computer. Actually, it's far from it. It's um, technology has completely gone away so far from it. So I love the, the, the different capabilities that you bring to the table. So, and I'm sure Telstra obviously this is why they love you. Um, we all know Telstra, obviously we've heard about it. I'm sure every listener here would know if you're outside of Australia, Telstra is one of the main telecommunications providers here in Australia. So can you go into a little bit of detail on exactly who is Telstra? Yeah, for sure. So Telstra is actually the largest telecommunications and, and tech provider in Australia, which is pretty cool. Um, actually one of the oldest companies in Australia too. So one of the, you know, the OG Australian companies and uh, Telstra really have, connects the lives of, of every Australian so that they can thrive in a digital world, which I'm really proud of. But I know, like Rashan, when you think about Telstra, what, what do you think about? Like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? For me, it's, it's literally 5G, 4G, any sort of ADSL 2 plus, you know, going back a uh, few, a decade or so, or any, any telecommunication stuff, because um, I've been involved with some work with TPG. So obviously Telstra is one of the biggest um, competitors of theirs, unfortunately, but um, it's, uh, so yeah, Telstra, you see, you see them everywhere. And the, one of the ways that I think for me, when I think of Telstra is it, how things are done is differently. It's not very old school. It's not, even though there's a lot of tech stuff happening, it's actually done in a pretty cool way. So that's, that's my image of Telstra. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're pretty spot on. Like phones and internet is um, the, the main thing about connectivity, right? And uh, that's sort of what I thought about when I joined the company back in, in Hong Kong in like 2016. But um, that's actually just one part of, the, of our massive company because, you know, I, I joined Telstra because I saw that all roads led to the connectivity. It's the glue that kind of holds all this cool tech stuff together. Um, before starting at Telstra, I worked in smart cities. I worked in virtual reality, tourism, autonomous vehicles, all these kind of, kind of random technologies. And I sort of saw that, you know, um, the connectivity was a thing that that was the common theme between all of them. So I didn't need to choose my favorite technology here. I can sort of work with all of them. So um, for me, Telstra is like the enabler of all those things. And we don't build cars, but you know, we connect you know, vehicles to traffic lights and pedestrians and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's what it is to me. No, I love that. And that's, that's, I think the beautiful part of the topic for today as well, because it enables connectivity in, in another level. So you know, uh, we're here to talk about IoT and some people haven't heard about it. And uh, especially I've had mixed mixed um, reactions from teachers and educators and especially students that are sometimes unaware of the term IoT. So it stands for, even though it stands for Internet of Things, what's your definition of it? What is IoT in your words? Yeah, so for me, uh, Internet of Things is the billions of physical devices that are connected to the internet. So that's to put it simply. Um, but it really is a system of connected things that can send and receive data and then act upon that data, uh, usually without human intervention. So if there's no humans in that loop, then that's machine to machine communication. So you might hear IoT and machine to machine kind of put in the same thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, think of IT devices that send data. So they could be sensors like a temperature monitor, an accelerometer, or some other kind of alerting sensor. But they can also receive and act on data. And that's where it kind of gets really fun and interesting. So things like a water pump that can turn on and off or a door lock that can open and close. So um, with IoT, it's anything and everything that can be connected to the internet, that's the thing. Um, but you know, the first part is connecting those devices um, then analyzing the data that comes from them. And then you can use that data to automate, you know, regular systems and processes. Yeah. When you talk about automation, it's kind of a scary word at the moment, but I like to talk about um, automation in, in respect to the four Ds of automation. So you want to automate things that are too dull, too dirty, too dangerous, or too distant for humans. Mm -hmm. So that's when you can sort of make the connection on where automation kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, like I said, the key component for the Internet of Things is the hardware, it's the connectivity, and it's the, the cloud and the applications behind that. So um, working with Telstra, we kind of have all three of those things. It's the end-to-end -end package, um, which makes it exciting for me to be able to see everything from, like, concept to execution. Yeah. Well, I think that's the beauty of it. it it's all real-time. You know, it's, it's almost instantaneous, and the, sometimes we underestimate the sheer amount of data that gets processed 
when something's happening and, and we were having this conversation of um, how Google Maps works, you know, when does it know that that part of the road or the highway is congested because it shows it in red and then within a few seconds it, it just goes into orange and then cool we can see the clearance but all of those things it's, it's just real-time data being fed back in so i wanted to ask you what are some examples of some iot stories and some success stories like some cool stuff because they're all gadgets and fun stuff that we like to use yeah, and I love that you said the Google Maps example because it really shows you that IoT is not a future thing. It's not like this is in the future. It's here and now and we're using it today. So some people might be um, surprised to see how much you know, Internet of Things systems are really going on in their world today. But um, yeah, I mean, all of these things that, that IoT will bring, for me, they all lead back to you know, more sustainable work for our people, you know, making everyone's lives safer and wasting less resources for the environment. So it's pretty much every industry. But if I could pick maybe, you know, one of the interesting industries I'm interested in um, is smart cities. Yep. So, for example, already today, we would have things like uh, intelligent lighting systems that will dim when there's no one around. So you don't need to waste energy and then they'll brighten back up when someone comes closer by. Um, you've probably seen parking sensors. So when you're going into a big car park, you'll be able to not waste any time knowing which road has the most car parks, you know, you can do that, but yeah. um, expanding it to a bigger and bigger scale, like when you centralize all those data points, you know, you can improve anything that can be measured from connected transport to more accessible healthcare, um, more energy efficient infrastructure. So the buildings are things that are connected um, and simple things like being able to know, you know which bins in the council need to be emptied. So um, we've done a lot of work for smart cities um, with Telstra in like Joondalup, um, and Darwin as well. Mm -hmm. um, more recently in Ipswich, a bit closer to home for you guys, um, we're part of a driverless car pilot, which is actually the largest in Australia. Yeah, so Canadian cars are pretty cool. Do you think that they're cool? Oh, well, that's the thing. Like, we, it sounds like things of the future. Like, it's kind of like back to the future, but right now it's... Um, so I think that's the beauty of it. You get, it's very easy to get excited and, and, uh, and start jumping on these things. Like, I remember seeing this ad I think it was Audi when they, or BMW when they first introduced how the car, the car can actually park itself and, and when it can reverse parallel park itself without hitting the other cars, you know, that just blows the minds of everyone who hates doing it and, um, and just solves real world problems. And it actually makes it safer mm. once that, you know, system is up and running and the AI system is actually smart enough. The sensors are very um, attuned to the context. So... Yeah. For me, I'm maybe a little bit of a nerd when it comes to those things. I love it. <laughs> but when you say safe, I'm glad you said safer as well because, you know, something like 95% of all road accident accidents are because of human error, right? Yeah. And I'm not really a big fan of autonomous cars. Like, I don't know about having fully autonomous cars, but I'm 100% keen on connected vehicles, right? And yeah. the idea of a connected vehicle is that it's assisting the driver, um, and that's what makes it, you know, real today. So you already have cars that do things like lane assist, right? That's not necessarily IoT because you don't need to send data to the cloud to know that you're going out of your lane, right? There might be a camera inside of the car. Um, but the connected uh, infrastructure, the connected vehicle ecosystem, you have things like pedestrian phones who are sending alerts to the car saying, I'm on the pedestrian crossing. You know, you as a pedestrian don't do anything, mm. but those two things are talking to each other. Um, you know, something like maybe there's another car going through a red light. So even though you can see it's green, your car will stop because it knows that there's something coming through the other side. So for me, it's not about autonomous. It's about connected yeah. and uh, really removing like the human error and I guess adding more insights to humans so they can make better decisions. And I think with IoT, it's all about getting things online mm. to help our offline world. Does that make sense? And I was actually picturing while you were while you were talking on that specific example is if you a lot of people cross the road now or automatically you know you're not thinking about it you just hear that noise for their green light and then you're mostly on the phone most people just look at their screen but what if yeah that that human error is then someone looks they're in a rush or they're in an emergency and they rush through the that red light you could very very well be in a major accident just because you're mind mind you're not mindful to what's happening exactly around you because your earphones are on you're looking at the screen but if that system can then all of a sudden pop up a message on the phone you know that says stop you know and then show or somehow communicates that because the system's all connected 
I love that. And you can actually save lives. So pretty cool, pretty cool things. Now, obviously, when we have I've heard this in the past episodes as well, when we discuss Industry 4.0 um, and 21st century, all these jargons all come up with a couple of different words like connected and um, intelligent and you know smart, all these different words. So in your opinion, so as, as a technology evangelist, why do you think IoT is so important to the f- right now and the future within this 21st century? Yeah, I think it's just going to be critical for all of us, right? No, I said is in future tense, but it is currently um, critical for all of us to sort of understand and have appreciation of these systems um, because it's going to affect all of our lives. You know, like the... Um, the global IoT connections are set to triple by 2025. So we're going to have maybe tens of billions of connected devices around the world. I want to make sure, yeah, no, it's so many. Even in Australia, we already have, you know, millions of connected devices. And we want to make sure that people and the general public, they don't have to be engineers, they don't have to be technical evangelists or anything. They just need to understand and appreciate what these systems are and how they interact with their lives. Um, you know, because these, these IoT technologies they're there to be making progress for sustainability, for prosperity, you know, moving away from the destruction of the previous industrial revolutions that you know, weren't so good for us in the long run. Um, I mean, if you look at Australia's like, top 10 expo- exports, so if you look at the top 10 exports of Australia today, education is up there in the top three, I think. Uh, but the other nine, you could say, are environmentally destructive, right? It's, it's not our future to be you know, digging more holes in the ground like just for that, right, we're going to be building smarter solutions for our world's biggest challenges to make sure that we have food on our plates and water in our bottles and technology and specifically IoT are going to allow us to do that. So um, for Australia, like we need that skilled resource pool. We need graduates with STEM skills, STEM skills. We need high school students seeing the value and opportunities in STEM subjects. They don't necessarily need to be going to study engineering, um, but, you know, having those those creativity and, and tech literacy to really like shift the needle and get more diversity in local talents in these these areas because like you said the 21st century is the here and now um and we need to be a part of it i guess and all of that technology is really underpinned by the network you know we said the network is the enabler and you know some, sometimes it might be wi-fi it might be bluetooth um might be 5g and that's kind of where Tosha comes in so we're like co-creating that future with, with tomorrow's leaders Um, The connectivity isn't the only important part. You know, you have to have those devices and you have to really have problems that need to be solved. So we're not going out there to make up problems. We need, you know, people that are part of the 21st century, students, teachers, everyone to sort of be identifying those problems and helping us um, come up with with solutions. So we want to see in the next 10, 20 years, you know, a change to more sustainable exports for Australia, you know, that especially in things like agriculture, you know, that's where IoT is really making big waves. Like the yep. whole, I don't know if you've heard of paddock to plate, but like having exactly. IoT, yeah, yeah. So having IoT sensors like from the paddock, you know, measuring the health and well-being of, of the cattle and the crops all the way to you know, the distribution and supply chains, right, into your plate. So you can sort of see, like, right, I know where this came from. I know how this, you know, produce got to my table. So yep. yeah, I think we're going to be more... There's more data for us to consume, so we kind of need to understand those systems a bit better. Definitely, and I think um, one of the one of the recent being an Apple fan myself, actually, um, I went and I was doing some research on the latest Apple watches, and so wearable tech, how those things integrate with the human body, you know, with the sensors coming into play. It's, I've found that in the it's becoming a tool. It's not a fashion item anymore. It's actually becoming a tool to monitor um, health systems and it was really interesting because the lady who was playing with the devices right next to me said, actually, you know what, I'm here to buy one for my mom who's in, a, in an aged care home because they want to set it up in a, way, in a way that if she falls down and she's alone in the room or the bathroom, it immediately notifies the health authorities as well as family members. And you can set it up and take those actions. Right now, it's, I reckon, just notifying, but then that call to action i think has so much more potential this is why i think this is really cool because it's almost an endless possibility of things but you you already mentioned the key skills of you know stem and that next generation one of the biggest things and challenges that we have right now is 
there's kids who are, you know, in their late teens right now that don't, didn't know a world without Facebook. They don't mm. know a world without Instagram. So for them, technology and all these devices, wearable tech, it's, it's normal. It's, it's there. It was always there for them. So, but the negative side of that is they're unaware of how easy these products are designed so that the consumers actually use it really well and really easily. But what happens behind the scenes is not known how this data get processed. So what do you think the industry can do to support, to make sure that these digital natives, you know, the kids who don't know a world without technology, how do you, how do you think the industry can play a role in facilitating that gap? Yeah, like you said, digital natives, born natives, like all the students of today were grown up in a world with Facebook. So um, that makes it ultra important to have um, people of all ages and personalities and genders shaping that technology, right? And you were just talking about the Apple Watch and I highly doubt that that watch was designed with a team of engineers, right? There might have been one or two engineers in the room, but the rest might have been like fashion experts, you know, it's... It's not saying that you need to be a tech person to be in tech. Like I think that bringing all those people to the table is what made that product so beautiful and useful. Absolutely. Um, anyway, but from experience, it's really hard to see the relevance of the things you're taught in school and, and how that's going to fit into the workplace. Um, you know, like I said, I never wanted to study engineering. Um, and when I did find out there was some cool engineering, like sports science engineering, like that's what I wanted to do because I could see, okay, sports, I, I know how my engineering degree is going to you know, have an outcome. But when you have something like I did, like communications engineering, it's really hard to see where that's going to go. So um, that's where the industry sort of comes into play in terms of that you know, technology education. So teaching, you know, let's go with IoT specifically, you can't just start with the technology first. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to start with the problem. You have to start with the real use case. Um, and, you know, that comes from industry, right? Because, you know, we can see what's happening in the world at the moment. We might bring to the table, okay, here's um, a problem that needs solving. How do you think we could do it? And the answer might be the use technology. It might not. It doesn't really matter in this case as long as, you know, your technology comes second, you know, the problem really comes first. Um, so, you know, students who have an interest in healthcare or in cars, you know, they might have no interest in technology, but they might have an interest in the application that, that you're pursuing as part of that, you know, IIT project or that um, you know, technology education. So, um For example, I think it was, yeah, last week or the week before, I was part of um, the Young Change Agents competition. So it's run by some tech schools around Australia, and I came in as a mentor, like an industry mentor. And there was a group of primary school girls I was with, and they were using their entrepreneurial problem-solving skills to collaborate and address these real challenges that they found in their their own communities. Um, None of them knew how to code, and they said to me, oh, we need to hire a developer. I'm like, oh no, come on guys, you can do it. Like there's all these things online. You know, we had girls that were, you know, talented graphic designers who were you know, helping solve global health problems or, you know, people that wanted to be future athletes, they were doing some basic web development to get a new sports page. So, you know, as you were saying right at the start, is these kids are born in the era of Facebook. So making the jump to just doing some basic web development in low uh-huh. code, yep. not a huge jump, right? So they can still pursue those passions in, in graphic design and in, in sports. Um, so I think industry brings, is the role industry plays is, is bringing that all together and seeing, showing students where they can fit in and where their, their unique interests and talents can fit into like the wider space. Yep. Um, again, not, school, not all schools will have access to this amazing technology. Um, I really loved your previous episode about you know, virtual reality and you were saying that there's you know, high-end models and low-end models that, you know, might suit different schools and you know, when you're partnering with um, industry providers they might be able to you know find you the cheapest option or, or yeah. potentially sponsor some technology or hire it or something like that so that everyone can sort of um, be involved and that will kind of make all the difference for the digital inclusion yeah absolutely and I'm, I'm a huge advocate of bringing the it's not just a siloed approach you need to have industry involved within the education sector and they actually need to feed back into the industry system and the tertiary system as well as secondary. So all of these stakeholders actually do need to work together. So you having a role within these schools and having that experience, what does IoT look like in schools? Yeah, um, well, I mean, a school is, is a built environment, right? The school is just a building. 
the, the campus of the building, and that could be transformed into like an IoT smart space for one, um, you know, using smart lighting or, or climate control. So that's the first thing. Um, you could also use Internet of Things technologies to as a teaching tool, so to enhance the learning of students using things like virtual reality or, or gamifying some complex topics. Um, but the third thing, you know, IoT is a subject in and of itself. Uh, it's the fundamentals of computer science and STEM, but it's also data analytics and design thinking. So if you link all those three things together, you know, you could have a smart building where the students are taking the data from their air conditioning unit. You're giving them that data, showing them how it's captured, showing them how to use it. Pair that with human-centered design and design thinking, and it becomes more than a STEM subject. It's, it's a way of thinking. Yep. So, so many learning outcomes can be achieved through that. Plus, it's going to be fun and mem memorable for the students, as well as you can, you know, you can make the school a bit more energy efficient. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. Like there, there are so many factors that you can tick off from just embracing some of these things. You know, you can actually have a uh, you reduce your carbon footprint at the same time, make the learning experience better for the actual kids. Doesn't matter what the actual year level is. It's almost an approach that you could do with primary school kids who can pick up a phone to the year 12s who are about to go into a more specialized career. So this, it's almost endless. And I think that's what almost is scaring a lot of educators because of the huge depth and breadth of what's possible. So do you have advice on how they could actually change that mindset at this very first level? Because I think that that's the biggest challenge that teachers do feel out of their depth at the moment a little bit is, you know, even just considering how fast these things evolve, what's your advice for them at this very point? Like in the next year or two, what can they do? I love that you asked that because teaching the teachers and empowering the teachers is one of the most important things in here. Um, I'll like tell you a bit of a secret. I'm actually teaching, a, I taught a code club group last week and that was a bunch of 10 year olds and I was teaching them the basics of coding. I thought, oh yeah, easy. Like I'm going to be able to smash this out the park, but they knew as much as I did. And I have an engineering degree and they're 10 years old. <laughs> um, so it is, it is scary. scary. <laughs> yeah. As a teacher, you know, the, the kids are, you know, no matter what age they are, if they're four or if they're 40, they're going to learn quicker than you and they're going to know more than you and a lot of things. So I think the first thing is just to accept that. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was quite distressing, but I sort of thought, okay, well, what can I offer them? And you know, as an industry professional, I can offer them that, that insight to how this is going to relate to a real world project. I can give them insights to, okay, how can you apply this and um, into a different situation? And how did I get from where I was when I was 10 to where I am today and, and what your future might look like? And, um, but yeah, the scary thing is, is that no one knows what the future for these is going to look like in four years time. So as a teacher, like don't freak out so much about the specifics of the technology. You don't need to learn a specific programming language or a specific device. Just use what you have available, make the most of it. And the important things that you're going to be teaching are problem solving. They are creative thinking. They are communication because those technical skills you know, sorry to all the students out there, but you're going to have to learn and relearn different technical skills for the rest of your life. And, um, you know, we're the same, you know, in, yeah. in our professional life, you know, you have one editing program and then that becomes obsolete. You need to use another one. For me, it's, you know, using Zoom one day and Teams the next, it's you know going to be completely different. So um, the other, last thing I would say, I guess, to make teachers feel better is that there are industry professionals out there and partnerships that they can make to bring experts into the classroom. So I did mention Code Club just then. That's like a, a free volunteer program run from the Telstra Foundation. There's awesome. things like, yeah, there's things like CSIRO, STEM in schools. So I volunteer at that and go into schools and help teachers like teach the tech classrooms and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but the worst thing you can do is just be too afraid and shy away from it. I mean, just just be open. Half my family are teachers and I think they, they find the same problem. Um, but we'll, we'll get through it together. And I think that's the thing. You do have to be able to understand how to learn through play and make errors. It's all right. Like even, even recently, just yesterday, we were in a workshop working through different Adobe tools and we introduced two brand new tools that they've never used before. Now, because we didn't on purpose give them step-by-step -step instructions, it does worry them because that's the mentality from, you know, 20 years ago. But once you get through on understanding the base concept, they realize that then they can go into wherever they want to think and take it to wherever. 
So it's quite interesting. And actually, I want to divert this conversation to a completely different angle. You mentioned 5G. Now, we, we're all used to seeing the 4G icon on our phones and laptops. But 5G, now, what is 5G, firstly, from, from coming from Telstra? Yeah, so 5G, uh, the G actually stands for generation. So it's the fifth generation of mobile network technologies. And so it's pretty much just bigger and better than, than 4G, right? But what is 4G? So um, what, what 5G will bring is that wireless connectivity. So think about things that can't be plugged into an Ethernet cable, things that are potentially moving or things that are potentially temporary. Um, that's where the mobile comes in. And uh, why 5G is different, why it's different from whatever we've had in the past, is three things. It's higher bandwidth, so more data can be sent per second. It's lower latency, so that data is sent much quicker, um, you know, in the order of it could be 10 times faster than currently. And the last thing is the capacity of the network. And think about it as like the scalability. So it means that we're going to have, you know, potentially millions of devices connected per square kilometre. And where 5G fits in with the Internet of Things is, you know, we talked about the higher bandwidth, the lower latency, that's going to scale up the performance of things that are what we call mission critical. So think about like drones or medical robots. But there's another side to the Internet of Things as well that needs simpler and lower power connections. So with the higher bandwidth, you know, we talked about the drones and the cars, they use a lot more battery power, which is fine for things like phones because we charge them every day. You know, the sacrifice is you know, so we can get entertainment at our fingertips. Um, but for some IoT applications, you know, think about in a rural farm, you might have cattle spread across you know, your 100 hectare property, or you, know, you might be um, in a city where you've got sensors underground or on top of a building, you don't want to be going changing those batteries in a hurry, right? So that's where the other side of the connectivity comes in, and that's the narrowband IoT network. And that can still be 5G. So lots of people think that 5G is just high bandwidth, 5G is you know, just you know, lots of towers everywhere, but it is also the other side of the spectrum. It is also that you know, long distance, lower power. Um, we can actually have devices connect up to, I think, 100 kilometres from the nearest tower and go several metres underground as well. So they can really be set and forget. Wow. And, yeah, you know, the reason I really wanted to emphasise that is because you know, 5G can be a lot of things. <laughs> it definitely is the lower latency and high bandwidth. Um, but, you know, as technology evolves, the way that we're using data is, is changing. I mean, when 2G and 3G came out, even 4G, we were just using, you know, text and calls. Um, 4G sort of brought along video a little bit. Um, and that's where companies like Netflix came out. You know, they were actually a DVD delivery company yep. before 4G came about. So, you know, with, with 5G, no one can predict you know, what the next big thing is going to be with 5G, but we do know is that it's going to be immersive, it's going to be you know, high bandwidth, and it's going to be yeah, something exciting. So probably it's going to come from, from a school. There you go. And I'm, uh, I actually have no doubt that one of the students using these things will probably come up with it. So that's pretty cool to hear. Love it. That's sort of the basic introduction to 5G. Yeah, and I think that's it's pretty obvious to then understand that this will, this is the enabler to make sure that we have the infrastructure to connect to all those devices. It doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes it might be the light bulb at, at your home that um, you just left, go, went to work, left the iron on or the stove on, and then you can just go to your phone and just turn it off. And it's funny because I've seen these Google Home products come out and it's actually scarily fun at the same time awesome. and. Um, it's, it's, I love that 5G can actually facilitate that. So taking, taking this into um, back to the school, schools and education, how can students prepare to this, prepare for what's going to be coming when we don't know, almost know what's possible? How do you prepare the students to harness and use this IoT uh, content? Yeah, no, it is terrifying because the things that students are going to learn now are going to be out of date by the time they're in the workforce, even yes. if you're a final year engineering student. Like when I graduated from engineering, the thing was like, wow, what I learned yesterday is not relevant anymore, literally. Um, but the, the way I got through that was doing things like industry workplaces through my whole degree. But I actually took off, I think, six months um, in my third year of uni and engineering degree to actually go and work at Telstra in, in the Hong Kong office in network services to sort of recalibrate like okay bringing what I'm learning 
into the workplace and then backwards again, going from the workplace back into university. So having that constant balance between work and study is really important. Yeah. Um, but if I was going to name like the skills that, that you need to prepare and harness the internet of things, it's definitely, you know, creativity, curiosity, um, you know, things like having real good ethics and moral standards is important because, you know, with 20 billion devices connected to the network, you need to make sure that the people creating them really have a, you know, a good heart and, you know, a good head because it's used you know, for the right, right, right purpose, not, not for evil. <laughs> exactly. Not using it for evil. I think that's in Google's, um, that's their tagline, right? Don't be I evil. So. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, yeah, again, IIT is such a broad subject. It's going to touch every single industry. So don't get bogged down in a certain device or a certain software right now. Just use what's available to you and be prepared to use something different next year. Um, if you want to get started now, there's so many resources online. I won't even try and name them all, but um, you can start at home with like IoT projects. Um, you know, what I, I really encourage is that people find something they're passionate about and find a problem that, that can be solved, whether it's through technology or not, but that's a good place to start. So if your problem is, I, I hate you know, topping up the water in, in my cat's bowl. Maybe you can uh, create some sort of Internet of Things device that can sense when the water level is getting low and automatically you know, spurt out some water. I don't know. So, and I, that's what goes back to that, what you mentioned, how much of an impact this has in agriculture. You know, just being able to manage our crops and the sheer amount of labor that's involved with it. Now it can be 100% automated with some very, very basic sensors just rolled out. and um, that's what's I think very cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, you said the sensors that are basic and some of them are that, you know, these devices are getting cheaper and cheaper, easy to access. And I'm talking literally, you know, $1, $5 sensors you can get online, right? And what that means is, you know, the internet of things is really being democratized. So it's being easier to access for lots of people. And that means more and more that it's not just engineers that are having access to it. It's not just, you know, the elite, you know, rich class that can access these technologies. Anyone can and, and buy them or rent them even. Um, so I think that's what we need if Australia is really going to um, capitalise on, on the innovation and ecosystem opportunities for IoT. We need all kinds of people involved. And I'm, I'm really passionate about, you know, it's, you don't have to be an engineer to be in STEM, right? Yeah. You know, my colleagues who are in the marketing team, they're women in technology. My colleagues who give legal advice to Telstra, they're women in STEM, they're women in tech. So, um, yeah, I mean, you asked about what advice I give to students, but number one thing is chase your passions, yep. but not necessarily down the obvious path. So yep. if you're a graphic designer, you don't need to work for a graphic design company. You can work for Disneyland. Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, the, that's what's awesome. You can explore, you can find things. And I read this statistic recently, the average amount of professions have been eight years for the lifespan in the last previous decade and then for this decade it's actually now up at 18. So if you're taking the average person's working career, the professional career being what, I think it's about 50, 60 years at the most, given that the retirement age is now increasing, it's you're on average staying in a job for less than less than eight years, five years. So you've got to think of how you can constantly evolve and keep growing. Um, so this is this is the beauty of it. But the other side of the coin Students, I feel like, can actually embrace that quickly because they're used to being in this tech era. However, we have the other side of the coin, which are the, which are the, which are the professionals in the industry right now. And for them, sometimes even grasping the concept of how Bluetooth works can be challenging. So what's your advice for professionals like that and, and people that wasn't necessarily born in that era? They were actually born in Industry 3.0. So some of them were born in Industry 2.0. So what's your advice for them? Mm, that's a good point. Um, I found, especially being in the world of a developer advocate, there's lots of community groups out there that are exactly what you, what you talked about is professionals wanting to learn a little bit more about a topic they might not have um, experience in. So um, I would go and look up things like you know, meetup groups in your local area. Yep. Um, uh, you know, being on the Gold Coast for the last few years, there's a lot of different groups there. You know, there's things called hacker spaces where you can just go and go to an IoT lab where people just bring their own home projects and you don't need to bring anything, but you can ask about other people's home projects and they can get tips and things like that. Um, you know, there's lots of innovation hubs around the place. I'm sure that your city would have something. You know, I know at Ipswich they have like Fire Station 101 where you can 
you know, join their co-working spaces and things like that. Um, but these days with everything virtual, it's so much easier. So I'm actually co-hosting the Melbourne Internet of Things um, meetup at the moment. So if you go on meetup, you know, Melbourne IoT, um, and you know, we're bringing together people who are industry experts have been in the, the, the game for decades. And we have people who might be students and then might be just curious and interested in IoT. We have startups who are sharing, you know, their fails and successes along the way. So, you know, my advice to anyone who's interested is come on to one of these, you know, free meetups. Um, yeah, and just be curious. I mean, like I said, you don't have to be in tech to be in tech, right? You don't have to be at a tech company. Yeah. Um, you know, you need people like entrepreneurs who are working in a business and, and finding creative solutions. Yeah. I think that's very valuable advice given, you know, it's, it's, is as simple as that. Just be, be curious, be curious. And that stems on to wanting to learn more, wanting to feed that curiosity and you can go find more information because we're all connected. You can go to things, meet us, love it. So it's simplified down to two words, be curious. So um, <laughs> I feel like we can talk about this for literally days, but um, I'm just mindful of time. So what, advice can you give on how students and, and edu educators schools how can they work with Telstra and um, learn about IOT and these emerging tech initiatives because I feel like everyone needs to reach out and make sure that we connect and in interject with each other how can they do that yeah so I absolutely love the the virtual community that you've got going here Rishan, with all the teachers and educators involved and um, I definitely, you know, encourage uh, anyone listening to reach out to us at Telstra. Um, we want to hear your ideas. You know, we want to hear what you think we can do to help solve your problems. You know, like I said, the connectivity is arguably one of the most important part about the Internet of Things, but that means nothing if there's no devices or applications on top of it. So um, we want to work with universities um, to develop things with 5G. You know, there's, we're the third country in the world to have 5G. Yeah, you Telstra. <laughs> um, but, we, you know, there still isn't the applications and devices everywhere that, that are going to use it. So we need to work with, um, you know, bright students and, and educators on that. Um, I definitely, if you are interested in the things I talked about today, like Code Club and the Young Change Agents, um, you can jump online and start your own group. You know, as a teacher, it might give you a bit of a break. You know, the volunteers come in and teach the coding for you, so you don't need to do that. Um, there's a lot about training the teachers. That's really what we put the emphasis on. Um, other than that, you know, all of the Telstra staff are legends and they love like talking about their experiences and encouraging other people in tech. So um, if you know someone at Telstra, ask them to come and speak at your school or, or you know, mentor your students. So that's something um, pretty easy. There you go, guys. So that's been so much information and even, even for me, I've picked up on a lot of gaps in my knowledge and uh, about the internet of things. So Michelle, seriously, thank you so much for giving up your time. No, thank you, Rashad, for having me. And uh, we can talk more about tech another time. <laughs> yes, definitely. I feel like this is a conversation that's going to keep continuing. Awesome work, Michelle. Thank you so much for your time. As usual, a true lesson in technology and looking forward to seeing how IoT evolves to the next level. That's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to us till the end. Now it's time to jump on to rashansenanayaka.com forward slash podcast and check out the show notes from today's episode. Click on the direct links to check out the amazing work that Michelle and her colleagues at Telstra are doing. Check out the Innovation Center as well as the other details listed in the show notes. Feel free to connect with her on LinkedIn as well as give her a shout out and share your thoughts. Last but not least, click subscribe and share the love with a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback about today's topic and where IoT is going to take things to the next level. So till next time. <laughs>